Hundreds of thousands of researchers around the world are working to improve life and address imminent threats to humanity. Often their research ends up in the scientific valley of death in the form of publications and patents that never see the light of day. That is about to change. Welcome to the Lab to Startup podcast, hosted by Naresh Sunkara, founder and executive director of the Berkeley Postdoc Entrepreneurship Program at the University of California, Berkeley. This show has two main goals. Share the stories of those who have successfully founded startups based on their own research and highlight resources needed to help those aspiring to launch startups in the deep tech space. Whether it's electric cars, vaccines, addressing climate change concerns, or possibly establishing life on other planets, Naresh and his esteemed guests want to help scientists, engineers, faculty, and researchers bring their innovations to market. Learn more and subscribe today at labtostartup.com. And now, here's Naresh. My guest today is Hunter McDaniel, the founder and CEO of Ubiquity, a startup exploiting quantum dots to improve agricultural yield in greenhouses and generating electricity by embedding them into windows. Hunter earned a PhD in material sciences and engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign before joining Las Almost National Lab in the chemistry division where the technology was originally developed. The startup raised more than $10 million and is currently working with partners like NASA, SpaceX, and US Air Force, amongst others. In this episode of Lab to Startup, we talk about how non-toxic quantum dots were developed at Las Almas, the evolution of the use cases, fundraising trials and tribulations, the complications of convincing multiple stakeholders in the solar space, and how Hunter's grit and persistence helped him in building the startup. I got to learn a lot from Hunter, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. All right, Hunter, welcome to the show. Super excited to have you here. Let us frame the conversation by talking about the main problems that you're solving at Ubiquity and the solution that you have come up with, and then we'll go into the technology. Well, thanks, Naresh. I really appreciate your time and happy to be here. So we serve two main markets primarily. The first product that's commercially available now is greenhouse film that leverages quantum dots to improve the quality of light in a greenhouse. Currently, if you want to control the spectrum of light, the color of light for plants, which has a big impact on their growth, you're stuck with lighting. And lighting is very expensive and energy intensive. So there's an ongoing operational expense and then the initial expense of purchasing that lighting. Not to mention a lot of greenhouses just don't have the electrical infrastructure to be able to power lighting in the first place. So we offer a film that takes sunlight and shifts the color to be more of a redder spectrum that is more potent for photosynthesis. So that's the first product is about quality of light in the greenhouse without the cost and the energy required for lighting. The second market is related. It also involves using quantum dots in the facade of a building, but in particular in glass and windows, primarily for commercial buildings, could be residential, but it's the windows. And in that case, it's more about really harvesting sunlight to generate electricity. So the problem being solved there, there's a couple kind of folded in there, but the big one is in urban areas, there's nowhere to put renewable energy. There's no real estate available, no space available to put solar in a city or wind turbines or other kinds of renewable sources of electricity. But there is plenty of glass, especially in cities. If you just look around, you'll see these tall buildings are just completely covered in glass. So the idea is that can we leverage the ubiquitous glass on the facades of buildings to power those buildings ultimately? So it's renewable energy for urban areas while maintaining transparency so that it could be facade integrated. And those do seem very different, but they both leverage a fluorescent material called quantum dots that partially absorbs sunlight and then manipulates that right directly on the facade of the building, ultimately for energy efficiency. Wonderful. Maybe you can talk about what quantum dots are and how we are using them here. So I'm a big quantum dot nerd. I could talk about this for days and I'll try to spare you the details. At the highest level, it's a fluorescent material. And fluorescence is a process by which light is absorbed and then re-emitted as a new color. Some classic examples of fluorescent materials would be like your highlighter pen. When you mark the page, that highlighter color really pops. And that's because the ink is actually emitting light. It's absorbing light that's pinging on it, but then re-emitting it. So when you see things that are neon or popping in their color, that's often because of a fluorescent effect. Really all lighting nowadays has some sort of fluorescent component, even LED lighting. There's a phosphor that sits on top of the chip and takes typically blue light that's coming from the LED 
into a broader spectrum, and that's a fluorescent material. So there's dyes and there's phosphors that are fluorescent historically, and those are widely used in many different applications. The challenge is that if you wanted to make a specific color of light, you'd sort of just be stuck with whatever the library of materials that are available are. If you wanted to make a new color, you have to come up with a new molecule, a new phosphor, a new composition. With quantum dots, it's a paradigm shift because you can actually tune the color of light that the material both absorbs and emits by the composition and the size of the particles primarily. So we can make a rainbow spectra, whether it's red, green, yellow, with the same composition, although that's another knob we can turn in there, but by changing the size. And that's why they're called quantum dots. The word quantum is actually a quantum size effect of the particle being smaller, you squeeze the electron wave function and the energy levels increase. So it becomes more blue emitting. If you make a larger particle, you kind of relax the energy levels, relax the space for the electron and the emitting maybe more on the red side of the spectrum. And then if you just make it a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger, you can tune that color. So it's a platform technology around fluorescence that enables you to tune the color by primarily size, but there's some other knobs you can turn with composition or shape of the particles. Fascinating. Thank you for that plug-in with the technology. You call yourself a quantum nerd. Maybe you can give some background about your educational background and how you got into this. I studied electrical engineering and physics at UCSB originally back in the day for my undergrad. And I was in an undergraduate research group in the physics department on quantum computing. And these are the smartest people that I'd ever met in my entire life, these brilliant physicists that were developing quantum computers. But they looked up to the materials guy in the room every time. I was really envious of that person to be the one that the smartest people I ever met looked up to. And that's because in quantum computing, the quality of the materials is critical to get the function that they wanted. So it was during that undergraduate research that I became really enamored with material science and wanted to pursue that further with a PhD in material science and engineering. And that's when I went to University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign to pursue that. And my PhD thesis was really around the synthesis of nanomaterials, quantum dots basically, but different shapes and sizes and taking it beyond the traditional quantum dot nomenclature into, there's some other applications that don't involve photoluminescence, but did a PhD thesis on how you can make these materials and control them and what their properties were and make devices out of them. Had an opportunity to segue into a postdoc at Los Alamos National Laboratory after my PhD. And it was really along the lines of using nanomaterials for solar. And it was at Los Alamos where the founding technology was developed. And as I was finishing up my postdoc in 2013, 2014, where the first quantum dot products were hitting the market, the most notable ones that come to mind were Sony had a line of TVs that were using quantum dots to make a more color accurate display. And then the Amazon Kindle Fire, I think it was the Series 7 Kindle Fire, had a quantum dot display. There was a film in there that was manufactured by 3M that had quantum dots. So I had been working on quantum dots for all these years, and it was more of an academic pursuit. But around that time that I was finishing up my postdoc, it became clear that quantum dots were going to be a big deal commercially as well, because you had these big names, Amazon, 3M, Sony, launching products into the market that use quantum dots. So no longer an intellectual curiosity, but like a real commercial thing. And that aligned very well with where I was in my career and finishing up my postdoc, which enabled me to, well, motivated me, I guess, inspired me in a way to start the company in 2014 and spin that technology out into the market. One of the primary audience for this podcast is PhDs and postdocs who have been doing a lot of academic research. What was that ticking point in your academic career? Did you ever think that you're going to start a company? Number one. Number two, what transformed you into that entrepreneur that you would start a company? It had never been my goal or intention to start a company. Personally, I've been sort of motivated by what seems fun. As I look back on those transitions from, say, undergraduate to graduate research and then to the postdoc and then starting the company, I think I ultimately picked the thing, the option that I had in front of me that seemed the most fun. I wasn't choosing based on salary or some long term goal necessarily. And not that goals are a bad thing. I'm not necessarily advocating that just pursuing fun is the right path professionally, but it worked out for me. It was really coming to the end of my postdoc where I was exploring all the options. And the traditional option that most people think of if you finish a postdoc is you're going to become a professor. Faculty, it's extremely competitive. The odds are actually fairly low that you're going to be successful, but you throw a lot of darts at the board. I think I submitted something like 50 plus applications to become faculty. 
And I made it pretty far along in those processes was negotiating an offer with one university when I started the company. So it was looking for different options at that time when I was finishing my postdoc and pursuing the obvious one. But what happened was a little bit serendipitous with the research I was doing at Los Alamos. We were working with Sharp Corporation as a corporate sponsor. They were part of the reason why we were looking for a safer compound because they had given us feedback that cadmium and lead-based quantum dots that we had been working on previously and they had funded some of that work, were not going to be viable in the marketplace. So when I came into Los Alamos, it was really my job to go find the alternative and develop the alternative and developed a really close relationship with the folks at Sharp. It was a very productive relationship. We had a number of patents that were filed. We had a record efficiency for a type of solar cell that we were developing at the time. And I was fairly optimistic that they were going to carry that forward into the marketplace. But it was at that time that Sharp was falling on hard times in the market. And if you go to Best Buy or whatever and look for Sharp products, you won't find very many these days. There's kind of a long story there, but what it boils down to is that they were pulling back aggressively in 2014. I think they more or less shut down their North American operations, and they weren't saying that they were going to do anything with the technology. So the tech transfer office approached me and said, would you be interested in starting a company? And I said, I hadn't really thought about it. It's actually a pretty interesting idea. So I started looking into what that would involve. And actually, it seemed like there were a lot of parallels between becoming a faculty member and becoming an entrepreneur. It might not be so obvious, but in the early days, it's all about pulling in funding, building a team, doing a lot of research and development. And that was all very exciting to me. So I saw starting a company as almost like another faculty application. Let's just play that option out and see if it makes sense. And things click together. I was able to get the blessing of Los Alamos that this was okay with them and that Sharp Corporation was going to withdraw their right of first refusal, if you will, to the technology. And then I went and did my own diligence on intellectual property in this space. And I found that there were some background patents that were filed some years before by MIT. So I reached out to the MIT tech transfer office and asked them if this technology was available for licensing. They said it was. So I was able to get freedom to operate basically by doing my own homework on the IP background, getting those blessings, if you will, of approval to at least potentially be able to take a license. And then I launched the company. And when I told the university that I was in the final stage of negotiating the offer that I had started a company, (laughs) they weren't too happy about that. I was a little bit taken aback by it because when I interviewed with them and did the whole process, they were highlighting how all their faculty had started companies and it was very much a positive thing if they had these gigs on the side and stuff. So I figured, oh, well, they're going to be excited about it, but it wasn't taken that way. They got really worried that I'd be distracted and wouldn't be able to juggle the two things at the same time. And they were right. I didn't realize at the time they got really sort of shocked by it. And I was getting increasingly excited by it at the same time. And actually, I really wanted to stay in Los Alamos wasn't really any other great options besides working at the National Lab to do that. So everything sort of clicked together and started the company. Let's take a step back. So you decided to start a company and there was all these companies, Sony, Amazon, using quantum dots for their products. And you mentioned something about Sharp using cadmium and lead quantum dots. What was the issue with those existing quantum dots and what did you have to work on and how did that translate into a startup? Did that play a role at all? Or is it a part of the IP that you got from Los Alamos? It was originally driven by just toxicity, honestly. So those first products that I mentioned, the Sony TV and the Amazon Kindle Fire had cadmium-based quantum dots in them. It clearly was acceptable under certain circumstances to have cadmium-based quantum dots in products. And those had to do with the benefits that those quantum dots brought outweighed at least in the eyes of the regulators, the compromise on toxicity. There are regulations in Europe, for example, that ban cadmium. I think it's below 10 parts per million in electronics, but they had a carve out, an exemption for displays and for lighting because of quantum dots. And there was really interesting argument that was being made that the energy efficiency improvement caused less coal to be burned. And when you burn coal, the burning of coal releases cadmium into the environment. So they were showing this calculation that by using cadmium in these consumer products, it was actually resulting in less, <laughs> kind of crazy, but it worked. But you can see where my head was at the time, which is that's a lot of 
spinning a narrative and dancing around regulations. And those regulations are for good reasons. There's a lot of toxicity concerns there. So the idea was that, okay, maybe you can get away with that in some applications, but in other applications, a lot of the markets that had been proposed for quantum dots simply couldn't be accessible. It was a non-starter to have those compounds present. And for some companies, Sharp being one of them, Samsung being another, they just simply draw a line there and say, we are not going to cross that line. We're not going to put cadmium into any of our products. Even though, yes, we could jump through these hoops and maybe get it allowed, we're just not going to do it. So that was really where the perspective I was coming to this from was that in my PhD thesis, every single paper I wrote, my entire thesis was based on cadmium-based compounds. On the one hand, I was pretty comfortable working with it. I didn't feel like it was as bad as people thought it was in a sense. It could be handled safely, basically. It was bound in a crystal solid material. It's really the ionized cadmium that can cause problems. But I wasn't necessarily being overly paranoid about cadmium or something, but it was pretty obvious to me that in the marketplace, people really wanted to get rid of the cadmium. So the way we approached it was cadmium has been a problem for other industries as well, namely the solar industry. One of the most efficient semiconductors for solar is cadmium telluride. And actually, one of the largest solar companies in the world, maybe the largest, is First Solar. And First Solar manufactures cadmium telluride solar cells. But they have significant constraints around how those solar cells can be used. They have to be recycled. So the solar industry was highly motivated to find an alternate to cadmium telluride, thin films, semiconductor, which work much better than silicon, by the way. That's a whole other story of why silicon is so ubiquitous in solar. It's an indirect gap semiconductor. You need a lot thicker material to absorb all the sunlight, like orders of magnitude thicker than you would with cadmium telluride. But anyway, the way that the solar industry approached that was, you look at the periodic table, you can kind of see that you could balance the charge of cadmium by replacing every two cadmium ions with a copper and indium ion. They kind of straddle cadmium on the periodic table. Cadmium is a group two element, copper is a group one element, and then indium is a group three. So basically two group two elements, you get two times two minus, could be balanced with a group one, one minus, and then a group three, three minus. So copper and indium together chemically look a lot like two cadmium ions, but they don't have that toxicity aspect. So this is widely known in the solar industry as SIGs. The C in SIGs is copper, the I is indium, and then they add gallium to tune the band gap, so that's the G, and then the S is typically sulfur or selenium or some alloy in there. So it looks a lot like cadmium selenide, cadmium telluride, but without the cadmium, you can swap in copper and indium. Now in solar, it, it did create a lot of problems because by having copper and indium, you create this increasing complexity of the material. So there's more defects. You can end up with having just a copper sulfide region, and then you have an indium sulfide region, and those don't have the right properties. You really have to have copper in the crystal lattice, alternating copper, indium, copper, indium, copper, indium. Otherwise, you end up with a lot of defects and a bad material. But this had been somewhat figured out in solar, and that's SIGs. So we thought, well, maybe we can make quantum dots out of SIGs. And that was where MIT led the charge. They were the first ones to report making nanocrystals out of carpernium diselenide and carpernium disulfide out of the Bewindi group. They just did this one short paper in the Journal of American Chemical Society. The quality of the material wasn't that good. It was about 30%, 20% efficient at emitting light, but they had proven the concept, filed a patent, published the two-page paper, and then they kind of moved on to some other projects and didn't do much else with it. But we had found that paper, and I didn't know until later that there had been a patent filed, which is why when I did find that out, I went to MIT and asked about that. But anyway, that was inspiring for us that they had been able to get the reaction conditions just right to be able to make nanocrystals that did have that alternating copper indium, copper indium. As you add these more elements, it just creates more difficulty in making the right balance of the elements in the material. So it is challenging. In that regard, and that's where I was focusing as my postdoc was, can we make this stuff? And ultimately, we were able to make it with roughly 80% efficiency, much better than the MIT process, with a lot lower cost, simpler. And that was the basis for the IP that came out of Los Alamos, was these new methods of making higher quality material. And MIT had the very first composition of matter patents on the proof of concept. Thank you so much for that story. 
I'm a chemist by training too, so I loved everything that you mentioned about. So here we are. We found this new material with copper and indium, better quantum dots. Tell us the story about what did that startup formation look like? And you talked about the naivety. Touch on that as you tell the story of that. I'd love to hear that story. It seems like a really hard thing, and it actually is, to be successful starting a company. Just even that initial starting point seems really difficult. I asked around and met some people, some other entrepreneurs, and they're like, yeah, it's actually pretty easy. There's websites that you can go to that'll file the right paperwork for you, kind of like a very low-cost lawyer. So I think it was something like the corporation.com that I went to the website. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's see if I can do this. They created the filings. I formed an LLC. It was just me. I was a sole founder. Formed the LLC. In hindsight, I should have probably started with a C-Corp. There are some tax benefits to an LLC if you don't mind the hassle of having to change to a C-Corp later. But if you want to raise venture capital, VCs and most investors will only invest in preferred equity in early stage companies. And as an LLC, you can only have one class of stock. So preferred equity is not possible, which is why C-Corps are required. But the benefit of an LLC is that you can actually take those losses and share them through your personal tax return. So you can wipe out any income basically with losses and then not pay taxes if you have an LLC, if you're losing money. If you're profitable, it goes the other way around. You personally are responsible for those profits paying taxes. But anyway, so starting the company wasn't so hard formally creating the entity. I did get with a lawyer in Albuquerque to help with the bylaws, the founding documents, establishing the number of shares that I had and that sort of thing as my founder's equity. But what I meant by naive was more about not actually creating the entity per se, going through those initial steps, which aren't so bad. It's more about actually building a viable business, revenues and managing expenses, and then balancing that against what the resources that are available are, translating that into a product in a reasonable time frame. That was the part that I was very naive about. I kind of fell into a traditional trap around technical founders tend to be focused on the solution first. And it makes sense. Whereas I think if I were to do it again or give advice to folks, you should be solution agnostic and focus on a problem in the marketplace. I kind of give a hint to that in my story of the different versions of the problem and then the way that the solution is articulated. But that's where I think the naivety was. I spent definitely too many years figuring out where we should focus, what the business model was going to be, what the priority should be. So you basically had a solution from your research and then you are looking for a problem. That's where product market fits come in. Most people fail to get those things. Walk us to that story, how that story evolved in terms of you determining that market space. I think that'll be a fascinating one to end up where you are at the windows and the greenhouses. It was pretty clearly articulated to me as a postdoc that the problem was cadmium and lead to a degree, but these heavy metals. So this is a problem. Let's find the solution. It's going to be a new material. Okay, so we found that solution. And the naive expectation is that, well, okay, so folks are going to line up to buy those quantum dots and leave it to them to figure out how to integrate them into products and whatnot. It is natural for a technical founder to think that way because you spend so many years trying to develop this solution, very much an academic solution, if you will. When you write those papers, you spend a couple paragraphs at the beginning telling this big vision of how this material is going to change the world and all these big problems. But they're so far removed from their actual specific problem in the market that a customer is willing to pay money to solve. It's just very big picture, pie in the sky type of motivational stuff at the beginning. So when I started the company, the idea was, well, the name of the company is Ubiquity, which is short for Ubiquitous Quantum Dots. So you can see right there where my head was at. Now that we've solved this toxicity problem, and oh, by the way, we got really lucky that it's lower cost and that it's more stable. But now that we have those problems solved, quantum dots are going to become ubiquitous. They're going to move beyond the display industry. They're going to be in all of these different products and applications that people have talked about. For example, sunscreen using quantum dots, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, medical diagnostics, all different kinds of solar cells, traditional ones and emerging new ones. And then there's lighting and display as well. But now that we've solved these fundamental problems, quantum dots are going to become ubiquitous and we're just going to be able to sit back, crank out dots, and the checks will roll in. Okay, so it's very much a solution. Now bring your problems to me and I'll solve them kind of thing. Very naive backwards, actually. And it wasn't until a few years later, really after some National Science Foundation funding. So in those early days, the hardest thing, and even beyond the early days, the hardest thing is financial resources. How are you going to pay yourself? How are you going to pay for your lab space? 
your materials, your equipment? How are you going to hire people? How are you going to pay for the licenses to those patents, et cetera? So I spend most of your time trying to figure out how to find financial resources. And really the obvious one, and a lot of people already are aware of this, is to go through these small business grant programs, at least in the United States. Most of those are under the Small Business Innovation Research, SBIR program. It can be very lucrative. And I was successful after a number of attempts, the 10th try or something, at getting a National Science Foundation Small Business Innovation and Research Grant. And it was around using quantum dots in solar windows. That was one of the applications that we had envisioned when I was at Los Alamos. We had done some prototyping and actually filed some patents around using these quantum dots to make solar windows. Sold that to NSF as like, this could be a game changer, pretty early stage, but if you give us some funding, then we can go develop it. So, okay, great. So that's when I started to really drill down on the actual problem in the market that was being solved. With solar windows, it's about transparency, generating electricity, and being able to be integrated into the facade of a tall building, really. For a single story building, you can put solar on your roof. If you're in a non-urban area, you can put solar next to the building. So solar windows aren't really needed as much. There are some use cases there too, but it's really in those urban areas where you can't put solar anywhere else. The rooftops are small compared to the size of the building. In any way, you're using that for leisure spaces and HVAC systems and such. So anyway, that was the skyscrapers. It was going to be the market for solar windows. And that's what we pitched to NSF. And they came back and said, okay, that's great. And we'll give you some seed money to go pursue that. Congratulations. You can start paying yourself a small salary. But we want you to go through this customer discovery bootcamp process. Not that we don't think skyscrapers is a bad market. It's just a bit much maybe to bite off as a first market for a small company. So what we'd like you to do is be open-minded and explore all the different types of customers and applications for a solar window. See if you can find a niche market that you could start with. And I've always been a fan of Peter Thiel's philosophy on startups. And one of the things he says is that every great company starts by dominating a niche. For example, the classic one is Amazon and books. Now Amazon sells everything you can imagine. Your groceries, your, well, you name it, you can stream videos and download music and they sell everything. But they didn't start by selling everything. They started by selling books and they became the leader in that space. Okay. So that's what we should do too. We should find our niche, dominate it, and then expand from there. And that's where we started really drilling down even more. Customer discovery involves interviewing potential customers or value chain stakeholders. So different ideas were maybe people would use solar windows and automotives. So I actually went to some dealerships and just talked to the people selling cars and some shops where they're installing windows and window films and things like what do consumers care about with respect to their windows in a car? And then specific types of buildings. And that led us to greenhouses as a potential building that needs transparency. And we learned that electricity can be one of their biggest expenses. So started to really drill down on like, what is the value that this product could bring to these types of customers and really narrow down the focus into solving their problems it started to become more than me at this point. I had the resources to start to hire more people. And so I'm starting to say we instead of I now. And together, we identified that the greenhouse market was interested in electricity generation in the facade, but they were more interested in maximizing their crop yield. When we asked them about how would this impact you if we could generate electricity, so many watts per square meter, we said that'd be great, but we are not willing to compromise our crop yield at all. And we said, well, maybe with quantum dots, we can tune the color so that we don't affect the plants, but we can still generate electricity. And then we started studying how plants respond to the color of light and had this aha moment where maybe we can actually just make a facade material that shifts the spectrum of light and boosts crop yield. And just forget about electricity for a minute. It's going to be a simpler product. It's just a fluorescent material on the structure of the greenhouse. When we asked the growers about that, they started to get very excited. That very low cost way to boost crop yield sounds great. Started doing math on if we boost their yield of tomatoes by 10%, how much would that be worth? And how long would the product have to last, et cetera? Started doing some studies on that. So it was a little bit of a, I don't want to say a pivot because we continued along the path of solar windows with NSF, but we developed this whole new line of business around greenhouse films that actually came to market faster as a result of that. And that's where I get into like, there's really a problem there that we're focused on solving and tailoring the solution to fit that problem. And you may find that there's a better solution out there. So you should be solution agnostic. And I always recommend to founders, start a company, 
to solve a problem, not to push a solution. Here you are, basically, NSF gave you some money to incorporate these quantum dots into the windows to generate electricity. And you came out with that product and also something that will increase the yield of agricultural produce in greenhouses. Can you give us a sense of what is the level of electricity you can generate with your product and also the levels of increase that happens in agricultural production? With greenhouses, there's a lot of different test conditions, types of plants, climates, types of greenhouses. So it is a big part of that path to market to have data on those test conditions. And oftentimes we'll do pilots and trials with customers. Depending on the situation, we'll charge something for that, but we may be really eager to get that data and subsidize it. But we've seen as high as in commercial settings is about 30% yield improvement. And that's with tomatoes. With cannabis, I think we've seen as high as about 22%. When I say we, I mean our customers. We don't grow the plant, touch the plant ourselves. We are plant agnostic, but with strawberries, I believe the numbers are similar lettuce, maybe in the 15% range. And we have these case studies on our ubiquro.com website. I guess I should mention that we did create a separate brand underneath the Ubiquity company specifically for the greenhouse product line. So it has its own social media handles and website and marketing and sales. So if you want to learn more about this greenhouse product line, you should search Ubigro, U-B-I-G-R-O, or just go to the website where we've got case studies and you can read about the different trials and stuff we've done. So it's in that range of say 10 to 30% yield improvement in the best cases. And then for the solar window product, our record efficiency is around 6%. And that equates to about 60 watts per square meter or six watts per square foot of production while maintaining transparency. But we can turn that up or down. And that is a darker window tint. So I can more easily turn it down by lowering the degree of the tent. So you can make a lighter window tent or a darker window tent to generate more or less power. The ultimate efficiency limit is similar to traditional solar cells if you were to fully absorb sunlight. But when you let about half the light pass through, which is what we're doing, the limit is around 10 to 15% of what you'd ultimately be able to achieve in a fully optimized system. So something around half of what regular solar cells would produce. But it is a lot lower cost, partially because we're replacing that silicon material, the actual solar cells, by just a window tent. Most of it's glass and just a small amount of quantum dots in there. We use traditional solar cells around the edge of the glass, very small amount of them to convert that glow into electricity. Thank you for that plugin. I will have a link to Ubigrow in the show notes so people can refer to that. In terms of customer discovery, give us a sense of the kinds of customers, the solar industry, for example, for the window product. What are the kinds of people that you talk to and what was the pushback and what are the things that clicked in your discovery process? I'm sure there was a lot of no and what were the apprehensions about? And how were you able to transfer them to a yes if you did? There's a lot of challenges with buildings just right at the outset. Something that we did appreciate early on, and especially if you're trying to combine together multiple stakeholders in the building construction process. So you've got a general contractor, and then you've got a glazer. The glazer is the windows person that comes in and takes measurements of a window, or if you're replacing one, or puts in the new windows in a new construction. They're responsible for the window. But then you have the electrician. And then the electrician does the electrical infrastructure, et cetera. And the more people you have to pull together at a moment, the more complicated it is. And their incentives can all be different. The thing that the general contractor is motivated by can be different than obviously the electrician or the glazer. And then you've got the architect, you've got the developer, and maybe that's not the same person as the owner. And that's almost always not the same person as the tenant. So who's getting the benefit of the product? Who's paying for the product? And how are the incentives stacked for those other folks that aren't necessarily paying for it or not receiving a benefit? So why should they even mess with it? They don't want to complicate their life or take risk if they don't need to, unless they're going to be compensated for that. A lot of it was around the complexity of the built environment and doing projects there. Incentives seem to be a major drive as well in this case. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from traditional solar. I mean, there's some silver linings, but there are also some new complexities as well over traditional solar, but we do lean heavily on a lot of the lessons learned and balance of systems and modeling and stuff that's been done for traditional solar. And we've worked closely with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory on that. But I think in the early days, you're a company that's new technology, it's a new name. There's a credibility issue, if you will, because you're talking about a window in a building that's supposed to last for 30, maybe 50 years. So this company that's been around for a couple of years, do I want to take a chance with their windows? 
you're going to have a really tough time convincing them to do a new building with your technology at that point, right? So much easier if you can do retrofit. But then if you're doing retrofit, that changes the value prop. You're not going to be able to tap into the electrical grid very easily with a retrofit because you're not going to rip apart the walls. Very unlikely they're going to let you do that. Another big challenge is just simply making something big enough. Usually solar, if you look at the record efficiencies of solar panels, solar technologies, that get reported are far less than a square centimeter. If you make a solar cell the size of a square centimeter, you actually graduate to the next level chart. Those get a little bit more street cred if you make a centimeter by a centimeter solar cell. When you see that record efficiency chart from NREL of different solar technologies, those are very tiny devices, way smaller than the size of a window, orders and orders of magnitude smaller. So even to be able to install a window in a building, you've got to be at pretty big scale. So it's a chicken and egg problem. How are you going to get the resources and develop the technology and be able to make a window before you've actually proven that it works or that it makes sense or that it's reliable and you're a new company? So it's really difficult to get to that point. That's where those grants come in. So we were very fortunate to get into a phase two grant with the National Science Foundation. We had some support from the Department of Energy. And eventually investors started to take notice and give us a little bit and a little bit more. So you build momentum try to get that snowball rolling down the hill and it gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and you make steady progress over time. But the biggest challenge is just simply making something big enough to put into a building, convincing people that they should take a risk on putting a different window into their building and then having to have it be a retrofit initially. I see a common theme with development of deep technologies like this, whether it is healthcare or solar, the number of players involved in decision-making, the number of incentives that drive adoption it's a huge barrier. And the fact that you made it this far, I think that's a nice segue to talk about the funding you just alluded to. I think you started the company in 2014, if I'm not wrong. Talk us about the story about that fundraising. Initially, it was NSF phase one, phase two that helped. How were you able to grab the attention of investors? The ones that said yes, the ones that said no, just to get a sense of what are the people thinking about? What are the investors thinking about? Well, as a culture, we celebrate success. So it's very common to be checking the headlines and see so-and-so company raised a nowadays $20, $30 million Series A. And you see those headlines and you get in your head that that's the way you do it. You go pitch someone wealthy or the right fund and they're going to write you a big check and you're off to the races. The reality is that is so unlikely. The odds are so low. You don't see the headlines of all the people that pitched investors and didn't get any money, right? One in a thousand people get struck by lightning or something and they get that VC to write the first check. This is part of that naivety that I mentioned earlier. I did start off right at the beginning, like right away, day one, trying to connect with investors. And that was totally the wrong approach. Investors should be the last people that you go to for money for lots of reasons. But you can actually learn a lot from pitching investors and getting told no. In fact, I remember one of the very first pitches I gave, someone who's now on our board was in the room. And he didn't give me any money at that time or anytime soon. Now he has invested and he's on our board. But he was one of the most outspoken people in that room, I remember that day, telling me all the reasons why this is crazy and it's not going to work. And a lot of the things he said really cut pretty deep because he had experience with quantum dots. His company, ultimately, which he had taken public and sold for hundreds of millions of dollars, gotten involved in nanomaterials and he knew quantum dots and stuff. So he was asking some really smart questions. So I followed up with him afterwards. I was like, I could really use some more advice from you if you'd be willing to like have coffee with me or something, I'd like to pick your brain. By the way, if you want money, ask for advice is great advice. <laughs> if you want advice, ask for money. I don't like to say don't pitch investors, don't approach investors because it can be very educational. And there are silver bullets in there. You may pitch an investor, they say no, and then that's it. But more often than not, you can circle back a few years later, keep in touch and have another shot on goal with almost every investor. They'll be impressed by your progress. Don't be too shy from trying, but also don't be naive in expecting it to actually happen. Very unlikely that you get any cash from investors in the first couple of years. And if you do, you're going to really regret it later because of the terms and all sorts of headaches that come along with having those investors so early, because it's going to take you a long time. There's going to be a lot of bumps in the road, especially if you don't have the experience like I didn't. So I did try to raise capital from investors didn't work very well. I put some of my own cash in. I was able to convince a few family members to put a little bit of cash in. And then another person that was in that room managed a research facility in town. 
And they were willing to take a chance on me in exchange for equity. They were giving me lab space and giving me a small budget to buy materials and an infrastructure to really launch the business. I'm very fortunate for that. They got a huge percentage of the company in hindsight for doing it, but the company wouldn't exist if it weren't for that. So it wasn't like a traditional cash investment. I did get resources by giving up equity in those early days a little bit, and then had a lot more success with the grants and then with early customers. And that's where I always advise entrepreneurs to start. If you're solving a big enough problem, there should be people out there that are really desperate for your solution, potential customers or partners, so much so that they should give you cash early on to pursue that solution. And if you don't have that, if no one's willing to say, I'll throw you 20K or 50K or whatever, I'll give you a purchase order for something that we don't even know if you can make it. There's not someone who's willing to do that, then you might not be solving a big enough problem. It might not be the right problem to focus on. But if you are solving a real pain point in the marketplace, you're going to find those customers, those partners that are willing to take a flyer on you more quickly, more easily than you're going to be able to get a grant and a lot more easily than you're going to be able to get a check from an investor. So I'd start with customers, partners, then go to grants and then go to investors. And grants should be good at day one. The problem is that grants take a long time to translate into actual projects. It can be a year or so of preparing a proposal, getting it through the process, negotiating it. And then finally, can you afford to wait a year? Maybe not. And then the odds of getting a grant are also not that great. Sometimes I liken it to putting on a blindfold and throwing darts at the board. Definitely quantity over quality when it comes to SBIRs. Don't wordsmith it to death. I actually heard a reviewer one time say that if they found a proposal really well polished, they saw it as a negative because that must mean that the entrepreneur has too much time on their hands that they can sit there and make it so perfect and pretty. <laughs> it was just, it's crazy. But if they saw some typos and grammatical error, and this is just what one person said, that reflected better. Interesting take on that. I see grants as basically free money. What it'll do is it'll help you survive till you find that product market fit. If you've managed to get that phase one and phase two, it's like two years or three years of time. And the way I see these deep tech industries evolve is they evolve slow. It's not as if you miss a boat in a year, everything is going to close. I think setting that timelines right is important, that it's going to take a long time. It doesn't matter which startup generally takes a long time to be successful. I think that's a good takeaway. One of the questions I had about the investors was, how did the profile of the investors change that you approach when you first started approaching them and the kinds that are actually investing money? What did you learn in that process? I started off with the traditional FFF, friends, family, and fools. These are the people that are really investing in you personally, that have a relationship with you. Well, that's the friends and family. And then the fools are just, fool is a bad way to put it, but just is really willing to take risk that believes in, maybe it's you, maybe it's the technology. So that's where you start off. If you're going to raise capital in the early days, and those may not be the best investors, honestly. You don't want to take a big risk with your friends and family money. Lose money for them, you're going to maybe hurt some personal relationships and make Thanksgiving so comfortable. And then the fools part, I hate that word fools, but it can mean that you have some eccentric personalities or some people that want to be more hands-on, more involved, and have a phone call with you all the time. And have their hands in it. And that can be just a distraction with nothing else. So you really want to avoid that whole first category if you can. And then you get into like the really small funds, the seed funds. Accelerators have become very pronounced these days. It's sort of like a seed fund. Accelerators usually give you some cash up front, but then they have you go through a program. Sometimes they'll give you a facility, a space where you can start off for six months or a year or whatever. Have you gone through any in that process? We did two that were sort of virtual, so not physically located there. The first one was Breakout Labs, which was a Teal Foundation fund. Peter Teal had created this back in the day to support deep tech founders like myself. And we had, I think it was $350,000 from them and then went through a program and had a lot of support, but didn't actually physically relocate to San Francisco where they were based. And then later we went through the IN2 program, the Wells Fargo Innovation Incubator, which was originally at NREL, but I think they have another site called Danceforth, which is more ag focused, but the NREL one was more buildings, energy focused, also virtual and some cash, some support there. So that would be the second category, really early stage funds and angel investors. And I don't necessarily recommend going the angel investor route. 
But you can have some pretty sophisticated angel investors that look a lot like a fund, but you're really dealing with one person usually. It can be a family office, but those can be very wealthy people with very sophisticated strategies for investing, more like a fund, but they'll take risk early on. And we had gone through the Coretsu Forum group. I don't know if you've heard of them, but it's a global network of high net worth individuals. And in total, I think we raised maybe one and a half to $2 million. They participated in the Series A pretty heavily as well from high net worth individuals and angels and some small funds started to participate. And then in our case, it was just always difficult to approach the VCs. I've been trying to raise the Series A almost like since the beginning, very naively, but VCs are typically pretty sophisticated in terms of their thesis that they have and their scope of investments. And materials just really weren't a hot area. It used to be more back in the day, materials were kind of sexy, but the returns turned out to be low. The time to market tended to be long. And then the capital required tended to be very large compared to other types of investments that they could make. So a lot of the funds that were advanced materials focused pivoted away to bio or other specific markets that they focused on. And in the early days, I was very much a materials company. That's how I was pitching the company. We're a quantum dot technology company. Over time, I began to appreciate, A, that I needed to be more focused downstream on the market, on the particular product and the customer and the pain points, but for investors as well, because investors want to hear a fairly simple story, as simple as possible about the market that you're going after, the value proposition, the unit economics, et cetera. And then you get into maybe more of a sweet spot for some investors. Nowadays, that could be ag tech. And we do still span two of these broader categories, but ag tech with our greenhouse films is very hot these days, controlled environment agriculture, which is like greenhouses and indoor farming, vertical farming. There's a big focus area for VCs. So that really opens up a lot of capital for us to potentially access. And then through the other side, the windows, it's more about sustainability. Property technology is becoming big, trying to address climate change, have an impact, energy. There's a lot of funds that play in that area. So that's enabled us to actually access those kinds of venture capital sources of funding. So our Series A, we had participation from Scout Ventures, Epic Ventures, Plug and Play Ventures, Sun Mountain Capital, and then some smaller investors like the Kretsu folks. That's how the profile of our investors has changed. From the beginning, some friends, family fools. I really hate that word fools. I stop saying it. Angels, grants, very heavily on that. Some incubators slash accelerators. And then it was only in the Series A that we broke through to the traditional venture capital. Speaking of venture capitalists, do you remember a point or a data set at which point they started investing in the company? Was there a turning point in your observation? It's having a product on the market that's selling. I don't know if it's necessarily true these days, and you'll get different responses depending on who you ask, but kind of a litmus test for Series A is a million dollars in revenue. What counts as that revenue? Usually they want to say it's actual product sales because you've proven product market fit. So before that, you could call it a seed round. But nowadays, everything is flexible and investors can do whatever they want. But the key for us was actually getting that Ubergrow product to market. We launched that in late 2018, really didn't start to market or do much commercially with it until 2019. But having that brand, that sales channel and actually getting sales, customer validation, increasing amounts of data on the value proposition ultimately led to some significant investor interest in late 2019. And then it just always takes way longer than you ever expect or hope to get to that close. But we had a first close in the end of February, 2020. And I think you might remember what was happening in the world <laughs> starting around that time. And there's all sorts of speed bumps along the way, many of which are completely out of your control, COVID being one of them for me. So the Series A opened with that first close. And that was really critical to convert the notes that we had at the time into equity to get over that threshold of having conversion be forced in that first close. And then I still had additional capital that I was going to raise. And initially the hope was it's going to happen pretty quick after the first close, but then everything just sort of shut down and the stock market crashed briefly in March of 2020. So it took me a bit longer to get to the final close, which is in, I think, November of 2020. So the Series A was over that time frame and driven largely by just the greenhouse narrative, the greenhouse product, sales traction. And the use of funds is what investors were really liking to invest in sales and marketing. They don't like to invest in R&D, proof of concept. I mean, maybe those earlier rounds, but Series A, they want to throw fuel on the fire, if you will. 
So you got to have a fire burning first. Speaking of revenues, so that's what attracted investors in your case. Speak about the customers and the partnerships that you have developed over the years and what that looked like and the contracts that you might have gotten over the period from private and also government institutions. I mean, it's all about the customers, really, any business. The purpose of the business is to deliver value to a customer and then they pay you for that. And you bring a lot of value, you can grow the business. So customers should be at the core of every business, really, in the product, delivering on the promises that you make to them. And in the early days, I was a little bit just thinking about dots and selling quantum dots. And so I was very proud of the fact that shortly after starting the company, it was about a year, maybe a year and a half, I started selling quantum dots for R&D purposes. Those were very much people like myself some years before at universities or national laboratories that wanted to do research with quantum dots. And so we actually still have a pretty healthy product line. You can buy our dots on strim.com in small quantities if you want to just play around with quantum dots. But I think what you're getting at is more like the UbiGrow product. The window product line is not commercially live yet. We have commercial installations and we've charged for some of those and increasingly so, but it's not something that you can go buy online. Like you can our greenhouse film. You can actually go to like the web store and buy quantities of the film and get it shipped the next day for larger orders. You know, you talk to our sales team and we can negotiate whatever the details are. But for those customers, it's really about greenhouse operators. The user is the operator. The owner may or may not be the one that is driving the purchase. But you have a similar problem to the Windows one around who's receiving the value, who's paying for it. But more or less, it's the greenhouse operator. They want to maximize the productivity of their asset, their greenhouse, and maximize their revenue, maximize their profit. So we provide our product. There's a purchase price, obviously. And then we focus on those customers where the payback time is less than a year. So we've done the homework with them on their economics, or we understand their business, at least we think we do well enough that we can say, okay, so you get to a 10% crop yield and we know you're in this market, tomato market, selling wholesale, or maybe you have a fraction of direct sales like farmer's markets or whatever for small growers. And then we can articulate how much profit the typical farm like yours would have a baseline gross margin, but then on that additional revenue that you get, say booster yield 10%, you get 10% more revenue. But then there's a margin on that and we've studied that. So anyway, we help walk the customer through that value proposition of you buy this product and with these assumptions, you'll have a payback time of so-and-so. And And for some customers, that might actually be two or three years because we're at a higher price point today or maybe they're more of a commodity market that they sell into. And we won't really push it much further than that. We have been surprised by customers that aren't so hung up on that early on. They want to get their hands on the product and new technology And they're optimistic that we will get our costs down over time and they want to be an early adopter and stuff. So it doesn't necessarily always come back to that one-year payback time, but we've studied the markets, the crops, and we understand how it performs in different climates somewhat well. And we go after those customers where we know it's a slam dunk, where they can have a quick payback and try to dial in exactly what they care most about, and that's crop yield. You basically have to learn agriculture and the yields as well. It becomes your responsibility as a company. And along those lines, what roles did partnerships play in your life of the startup? Any interesting ones? For a materials company, it's absolutely essential. And the thinking has evolved about our business model over time. Initially, it was completely dependent on partners in the sense that we're only going to make quantum dots. Then we need a partner who's going to receive those and use them in some way. But it's really difficult in those early days to get someone to buy into a completely new idea and handle these nanomaterials, et cetera. So we had to do a lot of heavy lifting downstream. It was good for us too, to develop the finished product, develop IP around it, understand how it needs to be handled and processed and what the cost would need to be, what would the market accept and all that sort of thing. So we do need partners because at our core, we are really a materials, that's our core competency and not necessarily agriculture. I view customers as partners, but more importantly, I think what you're getting at is value chain stakeholders. Greenhouse film is much simpler than the Windows one. Quantum dots can be supplied as an additive into the polymer film manufacturing process. And usually that's only a few steps away from the end customer at that point. So the way we do it today is we work with a contract manufacturer that receives our quantum dots in a form that they can receive. We give them a recipe basically for the polymer formulation that the dots are happy in. And then we pay them a cost plus to make the film roll to roll, high volume manufacturing, kilometers a day process. And we get rolls shipped 
you can have them drop ship to the customer or we keep a pretty large inventory here as well so that we can deliver more quickly in some cases. And those partnerships are critical. In that case, it's more of a toller. It could be distributors as well. If the customers prefer to buy through a distributor, that's just how they're more comfortable. And then with Windows, you can add another five to arguably like maybe 10 steps in the value chain. And you really have to be partnered in some way with all those, or at least understand them because you have to incentivize them. Why would they do this? Why would they take a chance to try something new or handle a nanomaterial or whatever if they don't have to? So everyone needs to be incentivized. And there's a lot of different ways that can happen, but you have to mind meld with not only the customer, but the value chain stakeholders. Hunter, you've been very, very generous with your time. This is a question I ask friends in my deep tech space. If you were to have your way, paint a picture of the future that you would like using your technology, what would that future look like? And if there's a forward-thinking partner that is ready to use that, you want to plant a seed in their brains, what would that look like? As excited as I am about UbiGrow and the greenhouse product line, I've always been really motivated by energy. I feel like it's literally what makes the world go round. And energy innovation is, I think, what will lead to the next industrial revolution, if you will. We've had these almost step functions in advancement in civilization that have come from these more frequently than not, materials advancements. And I think energy presents a fundamental challenge for the human race. It's even more acute now with climate change. But before climate change, we just fundamentally had a challenge around how are we going to power ourselves in a way that's not damaging to the environment and is accessible to everyone on the planet, not just in more developed countries. So the vision has always been for me around making energy production ubiquitous and so low cost that we almost take for granted energy. There's so much energy coming from the sun every day hitting the planet. If only we could just leverage that in a useful way, low cost way that's not impactful to the environment, we would start to take energy for granted. I think that would be a good thing, like the air that we breathe. Or you know, to a degree, we need to conserve water, obviously, and in some places more than others, but it's very inexpensive. Energy is not that way. It's very limiting in a lot of ways, and especially with climate change. So the big vision is drive down the price of electricity by implementing an ultra-low cost embedded solution to harvesting sunlight. And along the way, we can make agriculture more efficient and have a lot of really cool applications, other ways of bringing value with quantum dots. But the big vision for me is really powering cities with glass and making the cost of energy negligible to the point where we almost take it for granted because we do get so much of it from the sun, plenty, more than enough. We just don't know how to harvest it efficiently. This is a fascinating story and such an important need that you're addressing, Hunter. Thank you for doing this. Before we get to my traditional closing questions, are there any plugins from the company, any job announcements, fundraising announcements? Well, there's a lot of news that's come out in the last couple of months. If you just Google us or follow us on social media, at Ubiquity or at Ubigrow for the greenhouse product line, you'll see a lot of exciting things and great pictures We just announced a partnership with SWM International on our solar windows. And shortly before that, a partnership with Helene on agrivoltaics, embedding our technology into solar generation in the same vicinity as agriculture. We have a partnership with Nanosys, which is the leader in quantum dots for the display industry. That's very exciting to us. They're leading the charge on next generation displays and helping us scale. So a lot of excitement in the news well, we're going to be announcing soon an expansion of our relationship with NASA. We're going to be announcing a new contract with the U.S. Air Force to explore deploying solar windows on U.S. bases. And a little bit of a teaser, we have a collaboration that's got our technology specs for a rocket launch on a SpaceX rocket, I believe in the fourth quarter, to do a low Earth orbit test of this technology in space. So there's just a lot of exciting things happening at the company, a lot of exciting things to come. We are recruiting right now. We expand to be recruiting more aggressively going into the end of the year. So folks who are looking for a job opportunity, feel free to reach out. And of course, I'm always happy to talk to investors, mainly for advice. They can find me if they want on LinkedIn or whatever. Excellent. There's a lot of exciting things happening at here. And I'm very, very happy for you. And coming to my traditional closing questions, if there are one or two lessons that you learned from the mistakes that you would like other entrepreneurs to avoid, what would that be? Well, I always like to say embrace failure. I know it's a little bit of a cliche thing. Don't be afraid to fail. We learn way more from our failures, actually, than our successes. And this is why I don't dissuade people from pitching investors early on. 
I think the mistake can be that you assume that you're going to raise that capital, but go make some mistakes. Don't be afraid to ask for what you want and be told no. But when you get told no, always ask for as much feedback as you can get. It can be difficult to distill that into like which feedback to listen to and which not. That's just kind of the art of, I guess, life. Don't be afraid to fail. And then what I was saying earlier, financial resources are the most difficult thing, really. And you're probably going to need a lot more money than you think early on. So have a disciplined approach to your strategy. And what I mean is focus on revenue as early as you possibly can. Focus on those people that you're going to be bringing value to and talk to them first before you even start the company. Ideally, you pull in some resources from those partners, future customers. That's the easiest way and a good litmus test that you're doing something that's meaningful. And then along the way, always be looking for non-dilutive financing grants. That's next. And then investors last in terms of where you're more likely to actually find financial resources. But don't be afraid to pitch them and be told no early on. And don't be afraid of the wolf man with the silver bullets thing. I've been told like, oh, it's a silver bullet. I can get you an introduction to Kozla, but it's a silver bullet. He says, no, that's it. That's overrated. Don't be afraid. I completely agree with that advice. And the second question I ask people, if there's like one or two people that played a significant role in your startup journey that you won't acknowledge. Well, you know, I have to say my wife and my family and my parents, you know, the emotional support is definitely critical. It's tough, especially if you're a solo founder. But there's one person in particular I'd want to highlight more than anyone else, which would be Catherine Chartrand. And I mentioned her earlier. I just didn't name her. Catherine was the executive director of the New Mexico Consortium. She was running this facility and heard me pitch that day very early on where she didn't have a check to write, but she saw a glimmer of possibility that this could be really big. And she took a big chance on me and figured out how to make it work. The New Mexico Consortium was not set up to start companies or be an incubator. And she saw something in me, something in the technology and took a risk. And that enabled the whole company to exist. And she continued to support along the way. She was a board member. And unfortunately, a couple of years ago, she passed away from breast cancer. But I think Catherine was truly my co-founder, if you will, because the company wouldn't exist if it weren't for her. And it's not just find your Catherine. I mean, definitely value those people that believe in you early on, but be more like Catherine too. Take some risk on some founder. Believe in people early on that maybe they seem crazy. Don't be afraid to take a risk on an early company, an early founder, because it can really pay off. I realize not always, but the world needs more Catherines. And if it weren't for my Catherine, the company wouldn't exist. Catherine Chartrand is who I will name. Thank you for that story. We really need those believers like Catherine's. I hope people take a note of this and try to support early stage founders in whatever way you can. But Hunter, thank you so much for sharing the story. I wish you and your team lots of success and big wins and good luck with everything. I hope to bring you back when you're highly successful and tell the rest of the story. This is part one. Absolutely, Naresh. It was fun. I appreciate the opportunity and let's keep in touch. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Lab to Startup podcast. You can find links to the resources and programs mentioned in these episodes, connect with Naresh, or subscribe to this show at labtostartup.com. startup.com.